the three things I'm going to talk about fairly quickly here are the, egg, the FDA egg safety rule and uh, the recall and the FDA investigation that we went through last fall. We still have some repercussions from that. And then what we're doing to move forward from this. And uh, Dr. Kendi talked a lot about laboratory things. He had a lot of great information, so I'm not going to touch on, on very much of that, maybe, maybe here and there. A little history on the FDA safety rules since this is emerging diseases. Um, and just to follow up, you know, back in um, 1970, the egg industry uh, said, we got a problem. And on the egg product side, there, were, there was garbage being sold to uh, bakers. Mrs. Smith Pies was caught using inedible eggs um, on, that, on that side. On the shell egg side, there were a lot of outbreaks of salmonellosis in humans associated with eggs. And one of the primary reasons for that is the quality of eggs that we divert to breaking or we divert to inedible now. We're moving primarily to hospitals, nursing homes, other places where they didn't have a lot of money, but you had immunocompromised people, like checked eggs and dirty eggs. Well, the industry got behind it and they worked with the Congress and developed the Egg Process Inspection Act, which became effective in 71 for um, liquid frozen and dried egg products and 72 for shell eggs. So we've not had an outbreak of salmonellosis reported from CDC uh, associated with egg products since then, since 40 years, which, which is not bad. And the outbreaks of salmonellosis associated with shell eggs really went down uh, a lot. And all of a sudden, uh, as Dr. Kinda talked about, in 1988 or so, 87 or 88, a fellow by the name of Dr. Mike Sinclair, an MD, who was at that time at CDC, put a lot of stuff together that had been accumulating over the years on data and said, hmm, we've got a problem with eggs in this country and salmonella teriditis. And some of our reaction at that time, of course, was, well, cook them. Don't eat them raw. <laughs> that didn't last very long. In fact, my bosses and I remember saying, shut up about that already <laughs> kind of thing. Um, UEP has supported the plan. You know, as Kenny said, we, the uh, industry started in Pennsylvania, and then when an SE pro problem started in California, a voluntary program was developed. Other states have voluntary programs. I mentioned Pennsylvania and California because I think they're recognized. I don't want to give offense to anybody. It's probably the best in the country. Um, we've had, I think at one time, 14 or 15 states with voluntary programs. Uh, in Iowa, when we had our problem last fall, they actually had a voluntary program, but it was one of those things where the guy that was running it took another job and they didn't backfill. And I think Ray told me that they had a similar situation in, in Alabama. And that's because we're faced with Wayne Paselli trying to put us out of business. We were worried about high path AI, environmental regulations, and you've got to marshal your resources. Uh, we didn't forget about it, but we've, we, like I say, we've supported it. It's on farm yet regulation, which I think the dairy industry has some on farm regulation, but basically on the broiler side and turkey side and beef side, FSIS, they'd love to go on farms, but they aren't doing it yet. It could happen when Congress decides to rework the authorizing legislation of the Federal Poultry and Products Inspection Act and the Meat Inspection Act. But right now, FDA specifically exercising on-farm authority on, for, for shell eggs, um, which is different. And that did cause some confusion during the recall last year because people were thinking processing plant and packing plant. And even folks that went into the packing plants out in Iowa said, well, they're clean. It wasn't the packing plants, it was the farm. Um, Dr. Kennedy talked about different requirements, but I'm going to mention a few. Biosecurity program requires a very intensive biosecurity program. It's got to be documented. Uh, you can imagine the challenges that you might have on a farm where if you've got several small houses, as Dr. Breitmeier, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, you've got one, one team, if you will, or one group of employees that are taking care of everything. And you don't have a dedicated staff for each house. Maybe when you get up, I don't know what, Clint, to 500,000 birds in a house, perhaps you can. So we still have people going from house to house. And FDA's identified that as an issue. So what we're telling producers now is, 
look, look at the cost versus the risk. And FDA, John Sheehan, has agreed with this verbally, that, hey, if you've got three 20,000 bird houses, you may only have one, one group of flock managers, and you're going to have to move them from house to house. But take some precautions. Maybe it's foot baths and things like that. Maybe go go to extreme and you got overcoats or something. You're probably not going to make people take showers unless you're in an SE situation. And then you take up that second step. One thing that's really been, a, I think, helped to us is because of animal welfare, we've increased our biosecurity because people are coming on farms and staging incidents. Uh, because of high path AI, we've done a lot of work in the egg industry on high path AI, to prepare for an outbreak. So that's brought us up on biosecurity, and then of course is the SE issue, and they've all kind of helped each other. They've complemented each other. That we look at something on SE, and we say, well, these farms are already doing it because of high path AI, and vice versa. Environmental testing, again, which again, what you discussed. So now the FDA rules says you've got to go on the farm. And in California, you're, you're requiring chick papers. I know other folks are looking at that. But you've got to test the pullets before they're placed. And FDA has told us they've got to be tested before they're placed, um, which is an issue sometimes because they want them tested, I think, uh, 14 to 16 weeks, and we place them before that. So if you go ahead and take a chance and it comes out positive, you're going to be pulling birds back out or doing something. Initially, we had an agreement with FDA that, hey, if people are placing with 14, let them te at 14 weeks, let them test at 12. And we told our producers, don't test at 8, don't, pe don't, don't test at 10, don't play games, but two weeks back, and FDA will be okay with that. Well, that's changed, so we're trying to deal with that. You got to test pullets. Then, uh, when the birds are 40 to 45 weeks of age, you test again the environment for SC, and that's manure belts and manure pits and fan blades and things like that. And the reason for that is that the research, after many many years, uh, indicates that that's when birds are most likely to shed SC if it's there, and they can sh they can have SC for a long time, and. And it's never going to, and it won't show up in an egg, or we won't find it in an egg. And then again, post molt, and that's because the birds have been stressed. Post the induced molt, they've been stressed, and the research again indicates that um, you're more apt to find it because the birds are more apt to be shedding at that time in both the environment and and in eggs. The egg testing, egg testing is not required until you get an environmental positive. Back in 2009, excuse me. 1999, when FDA and FSIS first started talking about this program, egg testing wasn't a, wasn't a highlight then. They were going to require eggs to be diverted if you found seminal enteritis in the poultry house, in the hen house. So you found a manure belt, you had to divert the eggs to pasteurization or to industrial use. And the egg industry worked actually worked with the Congress and uh, CSPI, Carolyn Smith DeWall and Farm Animal Concerns Trust, and uh, they agreed that it doesn't make sense. We'll be diverting eggs every, all the time. Uh, at that time, you know, we had a pretty high prevalence of SC in some of our flocks, but they weren't contaminating eggs. So that was changed, fortunately. But now, if you get an environmental positive, you've got the egg test. Dr. Kennedy spent a lot of time talk, or, uh, detail talking about that and the series of testing you have to do, a 1,000 eggs, every two weeks for eight weeks. Now, as he went through some of the test methods, the FDA ban method, which is prescribed, it calls for what, a 96-hour pre-enrichment where you just set the stuff on the countertop for 96 hours before you even go into your selective enrichment. I was talking to the chief, he's head of the microbiology branch at FDA, and I can't think of his name right now, and he said, I don't know why we do this. And he says, I think FDA or USDA was doing it. I said, no, nah, I don't think that was anything USDA was doing. And he said, I don't know why I would do it. I said, I can tell you why. Because you can't find SC eggs very often. So you just have to abuse them. And indeed, that's what happens in the outbreaks, to find them. He said, yeah, you're right. Um, anyway, folks in California, uh, UEP, uh, worked hard to try to come up with some rapid test methods. Two reasons. One, the FDA rule says you've got to get those test results back in 10 days. And in talking to John Sheehan, who's the head policy guy on this thing, he said, well, maybe we need to relook at the 10 days. I said, uh-uh. We'd rather it be one day. We can't hold eggs for 10 days. And, well, you don't have to hold them. 
But if you get a positive egg test and you've been shipping eggs for 10 days, you're going to be recalling eggs because you have evidence that you have adulterated product. So now we've got these rapid tests and, and uh, that have helped us so much to make this workable. You can get a result back in two or three days. It may takes a half a day or a day to break the eggs, I guess. But if you can get a result back in two or three days, our producers are making arrangements to hold eggs that long if they have to. Normally, you know, it's pack and ship other than around Easter. So that's helped us a bunch. Um, another big component of the um, egg safety plan is you've got to have a documented plan. And if you look at the inspections that have been made out there in the 43s that are posted on the web, the majority of the violations are because we didn't have something documented rather than some of the gr grosser things that you saw last August and coming out of Iowa. Um, you didn't have something documented, the uh, test results weren't, down, weren't written down correctly, or you didn't record. You said, hey, I'm going to count flies every two days or once a week, and if I have so many on a, on a spot card, I'm going to take additional action. Or I'm going to count mice once a week, and when, what do you call them, the cat traps or something? Uh, help me here. What do you call them? Tell you 10 cats. But if you don't have a record showing you did it, you didn't do it. Um, so we're finding that out. And additionally, there's, a, there's a, several more things that, that they have to look at here. Uh, your farm manager has to be aware it's not good enough. They can't go talk to Clint and say, hey, what are you doing for salmonella sampling? And he gives them the program. They want to know that the guy on the farm understands what's going on, and the handler understands about the tin cats. FDA and industry preparations. Um, the implementation period as proposed in 2004 was two years, or excuse me, one year. We, said, we told FDA, and we had extensive comments, we said that's too short. And we said primarily because of the laboratory thing. We don't know what we're going to do with this stuff on laboratory. And even in the final rule, they made it worse than it was in the proposal. So we said, we've got to have two years. And we went back to OMB several times and said, we've got to have two years on that. Well, they ignored us. It came out one year. And even FDA this past year, has, or almost two years now, has realized you can't do it in one year. And they've struggled and particularly because of the recall. And they've struggled getting people trained. They've struggled getting guidance documents out. And, and that's unfortunate. So we've had that. And I think, indeed, that may be part of the reason why we had a recall in Iowa. We didn't have a lot of time to prepare. There were folks out there, and I'm pointing to one of my producers again, that had prepared, that had gotten it done. But when you're fighting all these alligators, as you say, you take the ones that are right there first and until that date comes. Uh, laboratory issues, I talked about that. FDA, other than we were a little frustrated in the laboratory thing, they've been really good to work with through this thing. They're, and they will admit that their expertise on egg production is very limited. They basically have it in a couple people. Um, so they looked at us a lot, and we've had a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions with them. Uh, they developed their guidance documents. We developed our own guidance documents at UEP, which are probably more, more detailed, but we worked with FDA on that. We sent them to the FDA and said, okay, uh, what do you think of this? And they, they liked them. They liked them. We're finding now maybe they have some things that are a little different, but they liked those guidance documents, and it was really good to work with them on that. Uh, they have an extensive question and answer document that's still in process. Um, but where they've tried to answer every question, every legitimate question that a producer or UEP or state has sent in. And actually the, the document's not out yet. They were slow. It went to the attorneys. So you got pretty, you know, what color's the table? Red. Well, you spell red right kind of thing? Excuse me. Um, so it got hung up at FDA. And then a few months ago, uh, we went back to FDA with requests that they relook at vaccination, and that's held the thing up again. Refrigeration, I don't want to talk about it, but it's got, I mean, I don't want to go into detail about it, but it's got pretty stringent refrigeration, on-farm refrigeration requirements on, on us. And that required our farms to spend a lot of money in a lot of cases. For years, we've refrigerated by law after we pack the eggs. 
but we didn't worry about the HB4 pack and we we're moving them around. I mean, you may in Arizona or you may in Texas in the summertime, but in Minnesota in April, you're not thinking a whole lot about that yet. So we had some arguments that it was too, too stringent that, you know, nothing happens on egg for maybe three weeks, even if it has SE in it. So back off and give us some time. And instead of having them cool down, the or put them in a in temperature of uh, 45, as the law requires now, uh, within 30, excuse me, 48 hours, give us 72 hours. And then if we're going to hold them a week because it's Easter, tell us within 72 hours. Well, if we're, if we're just going to process them right away, it was 4, 55 degrees because you bring egg temperatures down slowly. And if you're storing them up for Easter, then tell us to get them on down to 45 in the environment. Well, we lost that argument, too. But even now, internally, FDA has admitted that they don't understand why they did it. They're, they're seeing the science, the science wasn't there. It's too late. Vaccination, we had urged FDA back in uh, 2004 to give some kind of incentive for vaccination. We didn't, we didn't say mandatory vaccination. We said give some kind of incentive. Maybe it's like they're doing now on these risk-based inspections, fewer inspections. Maybe the uh, testing requirements are less intense. They didn't address that. And I, in a meeting with FDA, I said, well, I guess you really did get some incentive because we understand we don't get rid of this stuff. We're going to be doing recalls and diverting product a lot. Um, but UEP went back last fall to FDA and said, we would like to see you make a vaccination mandatory. And I know it's controversial in a lot of areas, but our board, our board voted unanimously to make vaccination mandatory. Now, FDA, at the time, within FDA, their attorneys were saying, we may make it mandatory, and we think we can do it without reopening the rule. And we said, do it. We want it. By the time we talked to them, they said, we don't think we can do it. We have to reopen the rule to do that. And, of course, Wayne Paselli would love for us to reopen, for FDA to reopen the rule because he's got all kinds of mischief to throw in there. Um, so, and the FDA was not interested in reopening the rule. They had looked at vaccination back in 04. They kind of threw it out said it's not necessary. It's not a silver bullet. And there's some question about how effective it is. And we're saying, yeah, but it's a whole thing. Like you were talking, you've got to control the mice, the mouse population. You've got to control biosecurity. And you throw in vaccination, and you do it all right, you have a pretty good program. Anyway, they're going to put some, some questions and answers about vaccination in their uh, uh, question and answer document. Just to point out on the side here, the industry is saying mandatory vaccination. We're not to the point yet where we've got everybody in agreement. And it's coming, I think. But not everybody's in agreement that we should prescribe what a minimum program is, you know, like two live and one dead or something like that. And, and that's an issue. They were doing vaccination in Iowa, and I don't know all the details, but I don't think it was up to that kind of level. So uh, if we're going to say we're going to vaccinate, we, we need to make sure we're doing it effectively. Um, I talked about this slide at length yesterday. You know, the egg industry is really in the gun sites, if you will. Back in 2009, the same day that the president announced his food safety initiative from the White House, FDA and ABC and uh, folks like me were up in uh, Pennsylvania so that they could do the filming up there because the only thing he had concrete was the egg safety rule. It was low-hanging fruit. It had been laying around for 10 years. Uh, it, I don't know, something happened to it during the Bush administration. I don't know if it has, uh, it, it wasn't anything we did, but it kind of disappeared for a while and, until every four years. Uh, so we were in the perfect storm there that we were the only thing the administration had uh, in the FDA. FSIS is beaten up on uh, poultry broilers because of SC and broilers, as you, as you know. That's their, their poster child. So we've got that, and as we were talking a little bit earlier, Dr. Breitmeier, last year I attended about three different meetings on metrics. CDC and FSIS had meetings on metrics so they could determine how they're going to measure the efficacy of these food safety programs. I said, you know, we've not had any outbreaks for the last several years. Don't measure outbreaks. If you do that, one will kill us. I said, well, we'd like your input, and we talked some to producers, and, and uh, before that was completed, we had this 
tremendous outbreak, and it did kill us. So um, we've got to work on that one yet. It's going to be tougher now, though. Same time, the Senate had diddled around with the food safety legislation, so the House and others were using our egg recall to uh, beat up and try to get the um, Senate to move on food safety legislation. Recall is the biggest recall. Uh, I'm going to switch now to the recall. I'll take questions on the, on the rule if you have any later. But it was the biggest egg recall we've ever had. Over a half a billion eggs, 550 million eggs. Still represented less than 1% of the production. It was a lot of eggs. It got a lot of people's attention. It took time for FDA, to de for FDA and CDC to develop their conclusion that eggs out of Iowa were involved. And they were being cautious, and it was evident that they had, you know, after the fact, they were being cautious because of what happened with the tomato thing. When the tomato industry took a hit, and it turned out to be peppers instead. So you gotta re you've got to respect that. Um, but that meant that there were more illnesses associated. In the end, well, not the end, but, but when FDA announced it, there was something like um, 15 outbreaks out of 26 outbreaks of SC in this four-month period that were associated with eggs out of Iowa. And there were about five illnesses, an average of five illnesses at each outbreak. So you say, okay, that's 75. And we were talking about that, and I sat down with some stuff that CDC had done in the presentation last fall, Clint, in uh, Chicago and Atlanta about the numbers they used. I said, yeah. I'm talking to my boss, I said, he said, it's just 75. I said, when they get done, it's going to be 57,000. I was off. I think they ended up with 60,000. But that's, that's how that's extrapolated. So uh, yeah, our producers, I think, have, have, have seen that. Um, no one died. We're very fortunate there. And when the recall was made, there wasn't a positive egg. There wasn't a single positive egg. But it was all linked. And, of course, they found positive eggs later on. But that was, that was hard for us to understand, too, uh, for at least some of our producers thinking about this egg safety rule, and you've got to do environmental testing, and you've got to do egg testing. And now, all of a sudden, we've got this total disruption to a couple of companies and our marketplace, and I have a positive egg. Well, we explain that, and a lot of people like Clint understand, understand that. At the time, we had a lot of confusion about what's an investigation versus an inspection. As all this stuff hit the press and FDA's putting their inspection reports, the Form 43, on the uh, Internet, uh, we had folks asking us, is that what they're going to do to all of us? So it just came unfortunate. The rule was only in place a month when we had this recall. I mentioned the egg testing, that we didn't have a positive egg at that time. Um, interesting, the initial reaction uh, was... Producers and I, Clint, I'm not picking on you, and I don't know. I never talked to you about it, but I know talk talk talks to other West Coast producers and said, "Golly, the demand's up." And even even the East Coast, the demand was up, sales were up, and eggs were short. And what happened? Eggs weren't moving out of Iowa, and they were still filling retailer orders and retailer requests, and price of eggs went up. So everybody's happy for a few days, and about a week. They dropped like, what, a buck in a couple days? And that what happened then, I believe, is the retail orders were filled and the grocery stores had the eggs, but nobody was buying them. So then we saw the price of eggs, and, you know, eggs aren't $4 a dozen anyway. You know, when, when they were up to whatever they were, a buck 35 and maybe a buck 40 then, that's a lot of money wholesale for eggs. We, we just don't see that very often. And then all of a sudden they got whacked. The Peanut Corporation of America with the peanut outbreak a couple of years ago, we looked at that thing and we said, well, they got whacked and in about three months it came back. And actually for the egg industry it came back sooner. And as I mentioned yesterday, um, my own opinion of that is, one, we didn't have any deaths. We really got on it with the media. We had just UEP, our PR people figured we had like 3,000 uh, media inquiries and individual producers across the country were dealing with the media all the time and getting the word out, getting the media on our farms to show them, hey, it's not like you think it is. So I think that worked. Also, um, those eggs, even though we're doing the recall, were gone. They weren't out in peanut stuffed Oreos. 
and they weren't out in candy bars and things like that. So we were fortunate like that, and also it wasn't a toxin, so you know you cook and it disappears. So the 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 confidence rebounded fairly quickly. I think what a couple months, six weeks, a couple months, six weeks. So so that was good, and when we were pleasantly surprised. A lot of talk about what it costs the producers in Iowa. And I haven't seen the final numbers. I'm sure somebody at the uh, Economic Research Service at USDA will, will do a study. We know those companies in Iowa lost millions of dollars. But what's missed is all of our companies lost a lot of money. I mean, million, tens of millions of dollars because of just that six-week period when the price of eggs and the demand dropped. Um, how am I doing on time? Time to cut? Five minutes. Okay. Initial reactions when our folks saw the 483s on the, on the Internet that FDA posted out of Iowa, we started getting calls. And even my boss called me and said, Howard, they reported manure. It's a farm. We all got manure on our farms. And they reported rodents. Man, you got chickens and you got rodents and you got, you got USDA over here saying that for the organic program, you got to kind of invite the rodents in so that, you know, the chickens really feel good. And so, but the difference is, it's like I can have manure pile as high as that table in my manure storage area under the hen house in a high rise, as long as the chickens are above that. I could have 12 foot high stack of manure if I got a 14 foot ceiling. But if I've got a two-foot ceiling and I've got a three-foot stack of manure, I've got a problem. It's up there where the layers are. And in this case, as reported on the 43s, and I'm not dumping on the company because they're one of my employers too. They're a member of UEP. But according to the 43s, the doors were bursting open because the manure was, it was that full. In one case, Jerry Ramirez told me they had to crawl through two or three houses to get to the house they wanted to inspect because they couldn't get through. All kinds of reasons. There's only certain times of year we can, and maybe mismanage is one of them, I don't. But I know that there's only certain times of the year that we can spread manure. You can't do it when the fields are wet. You can't do it when there's snow on the ground. You can't do it when you're harvesting crops. So it causes building soundness. But it's a cat. California, open sided houses. They're writing them up for a hole in the wall where a mouse can come through. We have open-sided houses. It doesn't make sense. You know, we're trying to ventilate and stuff like that. It comes down to you got to control the rodents. And on the rodents, I had a couple of calls where people said, yeah, they report so many rodents. I mean, I saw rodents in my house last night. The difference was because of the short time frame, or I'm going to say that I'm going to give you the excuse, the short time frame went into effect on July 9th. The company wasn't done implementing it yet, so they hadn't completed their rodent indexing. They had set up, and they had a guy that's highly respected by the industry and FDA set the program up, but they weren't going out and counting the mice and the traps yet. And until you do that, you haven't proven that you've got the rodents under control. Um, flies, same situation. You know, there's flies on farms. Uh, I mentioned yesterday when I was up with that ABC News crew uh, two years ago, I called John Sheehan and I said, John, this is one of the best farms we got. This is where we take everybody. But it's July and the ABC News crew is, you know, <laughs> knocking away flies or flies on the camera. And this is good. This is a great operation. FDA understands that. And they, I think it did help as we worked out some of the rodent indexing. The feed mill, FDA was not looking at feed, but because once they got on that farm, once they're on the farm, they look at everything. Um, observations on the recall I talked about yesterday, and I don't I want to bore you. I want to just say that Wayne Paselli thought it was Christmas. While we're trying to make sure people don't get sick, while we're trying to save an industry, Wayne Paselli and the other animal rights terrorists are using it as an opportunity to tear up our industry and, and throw another bullet or two at animal agriculture. Re really discouraging. The media treated us pretty good. We had a couple bad things, but out of all those calls, they treated us pretty good. And I think it was because we were open with them. They asked us, can we go see a farm? We said, sure, come see one. And our members really were really good about that. Um, A couple things here on, on what we learned is on traceability. We have longs and we have shorts, 
and I might have an order for 80 trailer loads of eggs this week, and all of a sudden I realize because I've got a flock molded, I only have 78. So I buy two from Clint, or I go in the egg clearinghouse and I buy two. And there's requirements for that and, you know, specifications. But then I blend those eggs. If I've got a house of, of old birds with jumbles, I can't just fill my jumble packer head. I need to do something with these other packer heads. So I blend different sizes, and I blend from different houses. Well, one thing we learned after we got those secondary recalls is minimize that blending to the extent you can. And, and you need to look more, um, and I think our industry is ahead of a, of a lot of other industries on traceability, but you've got to look at where that case went with the 30 dozen eggs in it, but you also need to better identify what's in the case, what houses did it come out of. So our folks are working hard on that. And moving forward, I'll finish up with moving forward here, what we're doing. Um, again, we're working with FDA in strengthening our egg safety program. For 15 years, I guess, US, or UEP's had an, an egg safety program. We call it a five-star program. We've met with the FDA several times on this. We've got our food safety director who's talking to them all the time. And it goes beyond the rule. For example, it's a voluntary program, but once you get in it, you have to vaccinate. And you have to demonstrate somehow, you know, how your program uh, works. It's a third-party audit, an independent audit. And this time, you know, one point I feel strong about is we've got to stay out of the audit process. We can't dictate how the audit is done. The expertise, the audit firm has to decide, or the audit companies we work with have to decide, how can we really prove and look FDA in the eye and say, yep, they're doing the program. And we've really stressed that with FDA and a positive response from FDA in, in that. And we think this five-star program is going to do three areas that have to be addressed. One is our customers are saying, how do I know you're not going to embarrass me next month or next year? What are you doing to make me feel good that I'm not going to be embarrassed because I got caught buying eggs from you? If you've got this kind of a program, you can do that. You say, I can't guarantee you 100 percent, but I can go a long way to tell you that I'm doing what the law says and I'm doing more than the law says and I'm testing like I'm supposed to. And when I have a positive environment, I'm not shipping eggs anywhere until I get egg testing back. It tells our producers, say, we're still afraid of FDA and when they come in and what might happen to us. But when we have this program completed and we've got a program that FDA has looked at and said, yeah, we don't have issues with it, or no, we think you need to tweak it here. The FDA doesn't approve programs like that, but they can tell us we need you, you, you need to tweak it right here. Then as a producer, I have a lot more confidence that I'm not going to be surprised when FDA comes in. And of course, it gives uh, consumers confidence too, like it does our customers. The other thing, we've already met a couple times with uh, the folks at the Food Marketing Institute. And uh, you're familiar with the Global Food Safety Initiative, which is a big deal, particularly in processed products. But it's moving on the farm. And uh, we have long worked. I think there's four programs approved by the uh, uh, Global Food Safety Initiative. One of them is a safe quality food program that's ran by the Food Marketing Institute. We've been working with them on years. The first few years was just work because nobody was interested. And then people like Walmart started saying and Cisco started saying, you got to have it. So now we've got animal welfare audit, auditors going into our, our farms. We're developing an SQF 1000 program that will go on the farm, not just the pack and plant. And, F and UEP has the five-star program. So we had very positive response from uh, FMI from the higher-ups at FMI, that they're quite willing to see our auditors certified under the Global, Global Food Safety Initiative, not our auditors, but the people that are doing this stuff on our farms, certified under the Global Food Safety Initiative. And we can go in there with one audit and be recognized under the UEP Animal Welfare and the UEP Five Star Program, give us some credibility with APHIS, and people like Cisco and Walmart will also accept it. So we're, we're pleased with that.